partners that we're hosting. Uh, this is to share with you the work <clears throat> that we've been completing on slips and trips in collaboration with the Health and Safety Laboratory. Uh, the first two webinars that we uh, hosted earlier in the year, the first of those introduced the work that we're doing uh, or have done around research into slips and trips. And the second one explored some of the risk factors that contribute to slip and trip accidents. And you can listen again to those webinars on our website. Uh, the whole purpose of these uh, webinars really is not only to share with you the research work that we've completed, but also to help you um, work with your customers, um, sharing the insight that we've developed to help them manage the risk from slips and trips. So in detail today, we're going to um, step slightly away from the risk factors themselves, which we've been looking at in the other presentations. Uh, we're going to review just a brief reminder about what the project was about, uh, why we looked at slips and trips, uh, a summary of the risk factors that we considered previously. But today, the main focus is on the importance of inspection and maintenance when it comes to slips and trips themselves. And I'll finish by uh, just sharing with you how we're promoting uh, the work that we've done uh, to enable you to help your customers with this particular issue. I'm just moving along to the second side for those who are, are clicking through the presentation away from Skype. Um, now, in this day where we're talking about other risks, um, things like cyber and those sorts of issues, why are we still talking about slips and trips? Well, when it comes to heritage properties, Essentially, they remain very safe um, environments. They're not construction sites, they're not factories. But when we look at our claims experience, slips and strips uh, by far and away when it comes to EL and PL are the most significant attritional loss that we see uh, in that claims experience. And this slide um, has a rather neat box just in the top left hand corner, which provides a little bit of a summary around that. So for EL and PL, it's, it's approximately 30% of the claims that we see are attributable to slips and trips. Uh, the average cost of a claim is, is something approaching uh, 20 plus thousand pounds. And when we delve a little bit deeper, um, many of those claims are distributed across a number of cause, causative factors, really. They could relate to the premises. They could relate to cleaning, they could relate to the integrity of some steps or stairs, or they're related or attributable to the weather. So given that this was an issue for us uh, when we looked at our claims experience, uh, we have sought to partner with um, an organisation that could help us um, look at this issue more closely, but more specifically in relation to historic properties because they challenge um, established precautions that can be taken to prevent slips and trips. And this is usually because of their design of the building themselves and obviously the historic fabric of the building. So we partnered with the Health and Safety Laboratory, which is the research arm of the Health and Safety Executive. You can see their facility up in Buxton in the bottom left photograph on this particular slide. And the slip and trip unit there are responsible for establishing all the guidance that's been prepared over the years that the HSE use to advise organisation on the prevention of slips and trips. So a very established research team that we partnered with in looking at this particular issue. And I shared with you um, some of these photographs previously on some other webinars, but it's just worth reminding us ourselves of the sorts of things that we come across in terms of historic premises. This is a shot of uh, a cobble walkway, um, typical flooring in heritage type properties. So here they're challenging um, because of the historic fabric of the site or the location. Um, this obviously challenges uh, established research, um, uh, established guidance on slips and trips because here it wouldn't be ideal to be um, removing that floor surface and in all probability you wouldn't be able to. So typical precautions that you might adopt in a factory, for example, um, might not lend itself so much to an environment like this. Um, so, you know, that's one particular aspect, which is a concern of us. The next photograph, uh, just moving along here, if I can. 
yeah. Thank you. Um, obviously, some surfaces um, in heritage properties provide a combination of features which can be challenging, um, particularly if they become damaged or worn over time, or um, if because of the demographic, if it's a location um, which is visited frequently by the public, uh, here you might have people who are frail or less abled negotiating potentially some cha cha challenging surfaces. But really, again, as I said, at the heart of this is, um, is uh, trying to establish, given the fact that we are keen to protect the heritage fabric of premises, we're keen to protect um, the features that they have, what sensible and proportionate steps could be taken by organisations who are not only have employees but are open to the public as well. And that's very much at the heart of the advice and guidance that we've now put together. So from when it comes to slips and trips, the sensible approach is that this shouldn't be something that's put on the too difficult to do pile, that some simple, adopting some very simple practical precautions do, do, does make a real difference. Um, and it's not just about focusing on paperwork to show what has been done previously, although I'll touch on that again very shortly in relation to what we've discovered from a claims defensibility point of view. The other thing is um, a proportionate response as well. So for lower risk premises, smaller premises with less in terms of uh, footfall, the things that they might need to do to prevent slips and trips would be different to um, uh, many other locations. So very much is key to is acting proportionately here. So that could be dictated by the size of the premises, uh, the number of employees, volunteers or visitors at the location, the types of activities that are run there. A lot of uh, heritage properties now are diversifying um, into events. And obviously that um, introduces a number of uh, differing hazards, uh, particularly from a slip and trip point of view. So consideration of those will be appropriate so that you can actually actually act proportionately and the last I mentioned to um, being proportionate is really understanding what health and safety responsibilities you have so if you take these two photographs here um, on slide on this slide four uh, five I think um, then um, here we have a sort of uh, local parish church in the top of the top the upper photograph there low risk environment um, only visited occasionally you compare that to the photograph at the bottom right on this particular slide where you've actually got a living museum with transport um, uh, uh, attractions going on at that particular location so the considerations are different really so that was a couple of messages i wanted to get across before we look very closely at um, th this um, th this issue of inspection and maintenance the um, the literature that we've put together, the guidance material, follows very closely the HSC causation models, which we've covered in other webinars and in our final webinar towards the end of the year, we'll look more closely at some more aspects of this. Um, the top one on the right hand side, that's really a model that, that considers the risk factors associated with slipping and the bottom right is, is the risk factors that are associated with tripping. And a particular aspect of that when you come to a trip um, situation is obviously maintaining premises themselves. Now all the material that we've put together covers those risk factors in some detail and if you um, want to consider a little bit further the risk factors that the HSE look at and subsequently we looked at as part of the research you can visit their website and they're clearly uh, available there for people to look at from that point of view. But today we're not looking really at the risk factors themselves. We're looking um, more closely at some of the um, management aspects of um, controlling the risk from slips and trips. And that's really where we start to look more closely at the way slips and trips are managed. Now, this particular slide has a, has a really good um, methodology for managing health and safety generally, but is more relevant perhaps to larger organisations. Um, but there are aspects of that which are quite important um, from a slip and trip point of view. And as I said, for larger heritage properties, larger organisations, um, this might be approached. They might consider slips and trips 
as part and parcel of managing health and safety generally. But aspects of this will be important to them. So, for example, if they're in a situation where they have to complete risk assessments, then obviously slips and trips would um, form part of the risk assessments that they would need to complete. And that might help them determine what inspection um, strategies they might have for checking access routes and other work services um, used for pedestrian access. So risk in assessment is kind of important there. And obviously when we move into the bottom area in terms of the check and acting, obviously um, actively monitoring, so in carrying out inspections of access routes is important in those particular circumstances. And where there is an accident, a slip and trip accident, then obviously understanding um, what's gone on in terms of managing slips and trips or were there aspects of inspection, were there aspects of maintenance that were important, that could become important as well. But as I said, very many of our, our very many customers are operating um, their their organisations, their heritage properties are much smaller than that. So as part of this, we tried to establish what simple precautions um, many smaller organisations could adopt in terms of managing the risk from slips and trips. And we've tried to summarise summarise this on this particular slide. So the first thing, if an organisation has done nothing um, in terms of um, slips and trips, the first thing to do is carry out a really thorough inspection of um, their locale to identify any slip and trip hazards that might be present. We talk a lot in the guidance around the sorts of precautions that can be adopted in particular circumstances and I'll touch on that again a little bit uh, in a little, little while. But obviously determining the adequacy of the precautions that they've currently got in place to prevent slips and trips and then identifying any simple ones that they could take to help with that would also be important. Now in terms of today's um, webinar, looking at inspection, uh, one thing that is important is periodically check in that not only the precautions that have been put in place um, remain adequate, but obviously the condition of the floors, the access routes, the traffic routes remain in good condition is also important. Um, the last two elements really, um, obviously if there are employees um, and volunteers, then obviously providing training information to help them or position them better to prevent slips and trips. And the last thing from a claims defensibility point of view is collating some simple evidence to try and demonstrate um, what arrangements had been put in place in relation to uh, slips and trips. That's very beneficial from a claims defensibility point of view. So looking at claims defensibility a little bit more closely, um, as part of the thinking about slips and trips um, more specifically, the things that we see that are typically challenged from a claims defensibility point of view and not only the adequacy of the precautions that were taken, that's obviously a, a, a point, but where organisations are required to complete risk assessments, then sometimes these can come under some close scrutiny uh, from um, a defensibility point of view. Um, the last point on this is obviously the accident investigation that was carried out at the time, but the middle point with the red box around it, periodic inspections, this is something that come and can come under some line of questioning from a claims defensibility point of view. And we cover this off, you can see a little snapshot of the, um, the guidance module that we've put together considering slips and um, trips from a claims defensibility point of view that we've put up on the website uh, as a consequence of this research work that we've done, summarising some of the key points that we see of challenge when it comes to uh, claims and being in a better position to defend those claims should they arise. Looking a bit more closely at that, given that um, inspections are um, an aspect of effectively managing slips and trips, um, and obviously um, on top of that being in a position to either deal with the specific slip and, hazards, slip and trip hazards that are identified or taking remedial action to protect people until appropriate action can be taken. And that's particularly important in historic properties. Um, that, Given that that's the case, what do we see um, from a, a defensibility point of view when it comes to inspections? So the fact that any inspections were carried out is important. Um, some, uh, something else that's questioned is the frequency of the inspections that are made. 
the thoroughness of those inspections and I'll touch on these points as we work through this and um, for larger properties um, whether any checklists were used and if they were adequate that can come up from a defensibility point of view and obviously if people are completing inspections then if there is any um, training that they need to be provided with or specific information about the things that they need to check or the um, checklists that they need to use then that's an important aspect of that as well and again um, from a claims defensibility point of view documentation is important although it's not the primary focus obviously we don't want to have people slipping and tripping in the first place um, but obviously from that point of view the adequacy of the evidence that an organization has in place uh, in terms of being able to demonstrate what they were doing around uh, slips and trips is also important as well and inspection records can be an important consideration as part of that but again bearing that proportionate message in mind about having the adequacy uh, reflecting the arrangements reflecting the nature of the risk the degree of risk that's associated with the properties and um, the adequacy of those arrangements and the responses um, in relation to that so think about that um, small parish church uh, think about that living museum where they've got sort of transport um, and interaction of people with transport at that particular location the way that they would respond might not be considered the same so as part of the um, the uh, research that we completed um, we looked very closely at the arrangements um, part of the research was actually visiting a number of locations as you'll recall from the previous webinars where I spoke about the types of locations that we visited and we identified a number of best practice principles that people had adopted and we've tried to summary, summarize these now we're on slide 11 um, at the moment um, so really elements of best practice reflected some of the models that we've already talked about in terms of managing health and safety some common sense things that um, people could do so identify in all the access routes for which they're responsible for um, that they have a proper inspection and maintenance approach to that. I've used the word schedule here. That would probably be more appropriate for larger organisations. But really knowing the areas that an organisation is responsible for and periodically checking that they are um, in good condition um, and where possible either the main, they're properly maintained or that um, simple steps have been done to take remedial action to prevent against any danger. Um, carrying out those in inspections, um, identifying any defects, uh, we've already talked about that. We've talked about the remedial precautions that can be taken from that point of view and obviously taking um, remedial action uh, to correct those things in a timely manner. Now given the fact that many heritage properties will have to go for um, consent or uh, there'll be other planning considerations in relation to um, making alterations to those premises then obviously that can um, take some time to either get the consent um, so the, the importance of taking remedial action can become more significant so identifying all the access routes as we see in the photographs on this slide that's not just um, obviously inside the premises themselves looking very closely at the access routes there but obviously where there's responsibility outside for outside locations as we can see in the photograph in the bottom right, right hand corner here so understanding um, where the responsibilities lie and what areas need to be checked is quite important um, but also obviously you know um, the premises that we've looked we looked at and obviously within the heritage sector are very diverse so there could be responsibility for the considered condition of roads uh, footpaths car parks um, there could be responsibilities in relation to drainage which obviously might have an impact um, on uh, particularly slips um, ramps and steps and stairs and obviously we can see the locations here so we've got a combination of locations where there are cobbled streets uh, we've got uh, areas um, in wildlife preserves really um, where the public have access to so being in a position to check those um, locations is obviously quite important and one of the things that does get overlooked that um, we've identified um, is that uh, where there is lighting necessary um, to ensure safe access sometimes this is overlooked from an inspection point of view so obviously when inspections are carried out checking and any additional lighting that might be required uh, particularly as we're 
uh, and I regret saying this, moving into the winter months, really, um, when we're getting into the darker evenings, um, uh, lighting obviously becomes a, a bit of a more significant um, issue to consider in preventing slips and trips um, and as we move into that uh, part of the year. So obviously um, in terms of taking some simple precautions, understanding the areas in terms of responsibility and obviously um, making sure that you periodically and check those, check those, um, those areas um, is, is important and being able to evidence what you've done from a defensibility point of view is also important. So for larger um, premises, moving on the slide now, um, you know, where they particularly have high footfalls, um, it may be ne necessary to formalise the inspection process in smaller premises, just simply keeping a record of a diary. In a diary, for example, that um, a location was checked can be sufficient enough. Um, but we've uh, got a couple of um, support documents here. We've got some information loaded up on the website, which we've put together, which talks about these elements. Um, and the HSC have also put together a checklist. And now, admittedly, this is for more commercial type premises, but some of the elements in there might be a consideration here. So thinking about the types of things that need to be checked. So this is the step condition of the steps, the condition of stairs, any handrails provided. Uh, if, if the um, premises are large enough and the risk warrant it, warrant, warranties it, then obviously putting together a checklist um, so that, that there can be some consistency in terms of the checks made. Deciding on the frequency of the checks that are required, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, shortly, and uh, providing the training and information for people who've got to complete the inspections. That could be very, very simple, very, very straightforward, um, just to make sure that there's some consistency in putting those together. Can be important, not just in preventing slips and trips in the first place, but also be in a position of defence should a claim arise. And obviously, bearing in mind that proportionate message that this might not be appropriate for all locations, but um, just some simple basic checks, simply recorded or evidenced in a different way with phone footage these days or uh, photographs on, on a phone can be uh, enough from that point of view. In the guidance, I won't run through these, but um, uh, in some situations, um, Obviously, people who are responsible for managing health and safety aren't experts in the field themselves. And I'm thinking about, about a particular location I went, went to some years ago where the people there were struggling a little bit to identify the types of slip and trip hazards that they might encounter at their premises. So in the guidance on the website, we've um, got a handy um, outline of the sorts of typical hazards that people can come across. This one's for inside premises and slide 15 talks about typical hazards outside the premises. Now, that could be simply used as a, as a check, as an orientation check um, in terms of considering the uh, condition of the traffic routes, uh, the floors, the passageways, the footpaths at a particular location. So that information is available on our website and people can use that to readily access and think about um, the types of things that they need to be considering. Um, in terms of the point about frequency of inspection, as I mentioned, this will really depend upon the circumstances. So for many locations, things won't change that much over time. So here, the frequency of the checks that will be required will be less. So that could be, um, it could be as much as an annual check or a six month check. But again, some of the risk features, some of the factors that might need to be considered, you know, if there's a high footfall, if there's a lot of events, or certainly if the weather becomes inclement as we move into that time of year now with the, um, you know, obviously wet weather, uh, we've got the fall coming, um, we've got uh, snow and ice potentially. Um, so th those sorts of um, considerations, the checks that might be required there might be more, more um, might influence a little bit about what decisions are made about the frequency of those checks. And it's not just about inspecting the premises. It's actually considering what to do if any defects are identified, uh, potentially making a simple record of those and actually taking some remedial actions to guard against any danger that might be um, provided, uh, might, might be encountered both by members of the public and by um, 
uh, employees or volunteers who might be at the particular location. Just considering that frequency, so here was a shot of a location that we took um, during um, the research. Obviously, a, a fantastic um, condition in terms of the footpath here. Uh, quite a high, uh, quite a low footfall, really. Um, but not many diverse events at this particular location. So the frequency of checks would be less there. When you balance that against another location that we looked at, um, as I said earlier, a lot of uh, these locations are diversified now. So this is a particular location where they had a cafe. Now here, obviously, where you've got a, a higher risk of um, spills and there's food preparation going on, the, the nature of the checks that might be required here um, would be different. So here you could be looking at perhaps a daily check uh, simple check to just make sure or periodic checks during the day depending on the level of footfall and the weather that's encountered um, you might have a different consideration in terms of how frequently you would check those and the last point about fre frequency is really you know uh, with a combination of features um, that this might influence the types of checks that be, might be made uh, given the condition of the traffic routes themselves the floors uh, the footpaths, those sorts of things. You might have a combination of features or you might have wear and tear where the frequency of checks that might be needed might be more, um, more free, uh, it might necessitate a more frequent inspection. Just touching on the point of ma uh, maintenance, obviously we've talked about that it's important, but there are constraints on a lot of heritage properties. Um, obviously, um, trying to protect the heritage fabric of the building there may be um, consents and planning considerations that might be necessary. A lot of locations will be operating under constrained budgets. Um, in other situations, there may not be the, the luxury of maintenance staff on site to carry out remedials or short uh, or smaller type um, uh, corrections or maintenance that's required. Um, so those are all considerations. So what we've done in the guidance is we've put together some simple um, precautions that might be considered uh, where um, things not, might not be able to be corrected immediately. And um, in those situations, um, uh, some simple uh, precautions could be adopted to guard against significant danger if that indeed presents itself. So there's considerations here about highlighting the hazards themselves using barriers, signs, those sorts of things, where there are wardens or guides or others on hand where their role is predominantly to inform visitors about the heritage or the history of the particular location is um, also asking them to advise of any danger that might arise from um, any particular hazard that might present itself that can be um, remediated against. Are also looking at the visitor journey. We touched on this during the last webinar, but obviously if there is significant danger, is guiding people away from that um, danger. So taking remedial action, this was one of the locations that we looked at, and um, in this particular one, um, they'd taken the steps of obviously um, fencing off this particular area. They had to go for consent to repair the um, footpath around that, so they fenced off the location. Um, and so that was a really particularly good example of um, uh, looking at this. There was a, another access route into the premises which they directed people to. Here's another example where the gates are actually locked. There's no access permitted here and a suitable warning sign had been provided. So simple steps um, just to uh, protect against that. The last point I wanted to make was really about if maintenance is being carried out, then obviously protecting people who are carrying out those maintenance, that's part of the health and safety arrangements anywhere at a particular location, because those people carrying out work, um, the, the work might uh, be required to uh, use work equipment, angle grinders, those sorts of things. They might encounter hazardous substances. There could be exposure to noise and vibration and electricity. So it's just a word to say, because sometimes this is forgotten as part of the maintenance activity in normal operations. So where this is carried out, risks can be con created, which are not commonly encountered. Um, so thought needs to be given about protecting people who are carrying out those uh, out maintenance activities. So just in summary then, um, all of the information that I've talked about, it's obviously got detailed information on our website. It's all in a modular format, three or four pages, um, talking about the challenges that historic premises face in terms of managing slips and trips. Uh, there are modules dealing with um, 
legal considerations, defensibility, con considering each of the risk factors as they relate to slips and trips. So all of this is available on the website. Um, but really our key messages uh, around the research that we've done is historic premises can be challenging from a slip and trip point of view. Um, so they do challenge uh, established practice and we've hopefully put together some guidance which people can use moving forward. A sensible approach is needed. Obviously, it's not one size fits all uh, and simple precautions um, can really do the trick when it comes to something as straightforward as slips and trips. But a proportionate response is required because obviously those smaller locations, uh, the expectation isn't as great for those as it might be for larger organisations with diverse activities. The precautions that we put forward are sympathetic to the buildings, um, obviously ma matching their historic uh, aesthetic. Uh, and hopefully they're simple and straightforward. So as I say, just in summary, um, we've all the information now is loaded on the website. We've already hosted a couple of webinars which you can listen again to. Uh, we've got some social media activity. Uh, we've got another webinar coming up, um, in, I think in November now, which you're more than welcome to attend. And if there are any questions, you can use our helpline to access that information. So I'd like to thank you all for listening today. I hope you found it informative and hopefully signposted you to some further information. Uh, but thanks for listening and have a good day. If you do have any questions, if you'd like to just pop them on the Q&A function. And uh, I'll just give you a couple of moments to have a think about those. Okay, so um, if you do have any questions, then please do just pop them across to myself or Hugh, um, Antonio Coles. I think most of you have got my email address um, or ask your BDM, your CAM, and uh, we'll, we'll obviously get Hugh to answer those for you. Um, in the meantime, thanks very much for attending today. We are going to stop recording now and close the phone lines.